some exotic dream that grips me some hypnotic dream that lifts me and tips me over the edge I could do love to me.
So, um, my name is Jerry Scullion. I see uh, one of my friends down in the back there. How's it going? Um, I've just returned from Australia. So, I'm one of those guys that left Ireland when uh, you know, the bad times started. And I'm coming back when the good times are starting to come again, hopefully. Um, I was in Australia for 12 years. And I'm what's known as a service designer. So, can I see a show of hands just so I can understand who's in the room? Do we have any user experience designers? Couple user experience, okay. Any service designers? Right, okay, good. <laughs> None. Um, fashion designers? Give me a shout out what other kind of professions you're doing. One at a time, please. I can't hear you, what? <laughs> <laughs> what have we got? Graphics, graphics design, visual designers, yeah? Okay, business design? Web design, okay, great. So we've got lots of different types of design, and sometimes people who um, maybe are not in design as well. So um, I'm going to speak about three things today, right? One is going to tell you a little bit about my background and my appreciation of craft. Uh, I'll talk about where I came from and my early formative years and how that formed my appreciation of, of craft in the discipline. And then I'll speak about why design craft matters, right? So why do I care about this and why I think you should care about this. And then at the very end, I'm going to give a bit of a call to action on uh, stuff that I'd like people in Ireland to start talking about in respect to design. So my background, that's me there, the bald fella at the back, standing up, uh, speaking. I run a podcast called This Is HCD, which stands for This Is Human Centered Design. Um, show of hands, anyone's listened to the podcast? One, two, three. I'm getting there, <laughs> just a little bit more. So if any, it's basically, it's about anyone who's interested in delivering services or products for people, um, you know, the, the people who design those services. It's about how you actually get together, breaking down tribalism in design and focusing on the, the outcome to make sure that it's the, the best possible outcome you can get for the user. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. As I said, I was in Australia for 12 years. Um, great country, it's very far away, in case you don't know that. Um, but I'm originally from Drahada. Um, which is just up the road now, hey, and I don't have the Drada accent because I left when I was 15, and I won't, I won't do any more of the Drada accent, but I'll talk a little bit more because there are people from Drada probably here and they'll, they'll beat me up. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start, like from a very young age, um, I, had a, I had a champion of my mother, and she really um, encouraged my, my artistic capabilities. And why I mentioned my mother was because she allowed me to, to literally draw on the walls. I was like the youngest child. I got away with murder. And um, my older siblings would come home and I'd be peeling off the, the, the wallpaper and drawing with, with acrylics on the wall. So what I'm trying to say here is like I had, I had a champion and I was allowed to be creative and allowed to express myself from a very young age, which I believe it's, it's an intrinsic thing and it's, it's nurtured from a young age, from, from my family anyway. So... At the age of 12, I started to do painting, and by 14, and I'm not saying this as in like I'm great, I'm just trying to give you a bit of a background of what I was doing. I was taking commissions in the town, and I was really, really into art, but I didn't know anything about design. Design to me was, you know, pretty pictures, it was graphic design. I remember speaking to a politician in the town, and it must have been about 93, and I said, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do design. And he was like, what are you talking about? So there's computer programs that can do design. Now you'll be out of a job before you even finish your degree. So um, I ignored that politician, which is probably good advice, and I encourage everyone to ignore politicians. But um, I followed my own path, and um, I went to NCAD, and I studied industrial design. Any industrial designers here? Great. <laughs> right, so um, industrial design is the design of products, and um, it's a bit different in NCAD. Like, I'd come from a very structured educational structure in Drada, where it was like run by the Christian Brothers. And then all of a sudden I found myself in NCID where there was people with pink hair and um, you know, people were wearing like, you know, all different types of clothes. So it was a, a really different, it was a mind-opening experience for me. And the type of educational style there was different. And why this is really important to me is because we'd spend eight hours a day sketching. And for years afterwards, I always questioned, I was like, Jesus, am I learning anything here? Like, am I getting anything out of this? And I really questioned that for a long time. And it wasn't until probably about 2006 that I started to appreciate the, the thought to the hand connection of being able to actually do something and problem solve in the real world. And I'll get to that a little bit more and I'll tell you um, why that's important in the next slide. 
But during the course of this, I started to play music and um, loved music. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I probably wouldn't classify it as good music. But um, one thing that I did learn about the craft and the application of craft in music was that you, you can start playing music and you can start playing gigs, but unless you've got the craft of songwriting, you're going to get immediate feedback from your audience, uh, as in, in the terms of your shit, which um, unfortunately for me um, happened too often. But my, the craft of songwriting it was an immediate feedback loop. You know, if, you'd, if it wasn't actually appreciated, you'd, you'd soon hear about it. So the craft um, became something that I started to speak a little bit more and I applied that to my design. So I'm going to talk about a little bit why, why it matters, right? So design craft, I actually had a show of hands in work yesterday. Um, and I said, I'm going to speak about design craft and business. Show of hands, who knows what that means? And there was 10 people around the table and they all put their hands up and they're like, look, loads of questions. So um, as I explained, I'm the product of my environment. Like my, my mother and my family championed me to, to have an early appreciation of, of craft and creativity and problem solving with my hands. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what design craft is. Whoops, not there. Not there. There. It's looping. Hang on. There we go. So design craft, it's, it's the understanding and it's the balancing of needs of users. So like if you're designing a service, or you're designing a product, you want to make sure that what you're doing is actually of value to the person that's going to use it. All right? Now, people call that user-centered design, but I call it human-centered design because I don't like the term user in design. For me, it's, it's, we're humans, it's, it's inclusive, it's about being diverse, and at the end of the day, we're all humans. User has got negative connotations for a start, like drug user, and it's, it's very impersonal. So for me, it's all about understanding the human needs. It's, it's also about ensuring that what gets delivered is going to be of value. Um, it's knowing what method is ethically appropriate. And what I'm saying there is like businesses can hire design designers, but they mightn't have the experience to know which method in terms of research is ethically and contextually important for that person to do. So there was a couple of instances there, like I, I read on the way in Facebook are now going to, they're patented uh, a new thing where they're going to be able to listen to your, your TV programs as you're listening to it. Now, from a designer, an ethically sound designer, I like to think, that's got huge privacy concerns there. Like suddenly they're going to be picking up private conversations in the home, arguments, all those kind of things, and they're going to be tracing it. So Facebook is, I like to use that as the beacon of non-human centered design. They, you know, it's very business centric. And if anyone's from Facebook is listening, I encourage them to, to start talking about that because it's really important for society. So design craft is the integrity and the unwavering belief that design can change the world. And I really believe that. It's not something that you people just throw around. I believe that if we put design and the, the person at the center of the problem and we become emotionally attached to that problem and try and solve it, we can make the world a better place. So um, I think I've covered everything there. And design craft is everything to me. It's, it's li literally like if, if I lose my job, it's, it's, that's it. I, I only know how to do design. So design is my life. Um, but let's talk about design craft and its role in business, right? So the environment. So imagine you go back to work today and you said, there was this guy and he was talking about design craft in business. And you want to try and move your businesses forward to become more design centric. And not, a, not just about hiring designers to sit in the corner and kind of go, God, I'm going to do a new business card or God, I'm going to do, do a new flyer. Design is a mindset, right? And it's about allowing businesses to get closer to those problems and listening to their, their customers or whatever the service is that you're designing for. So, but if you want to go back to your business and you want to talk to them a little bit about what you can do from your environment perspective, you can start this. And it's a space where people can bring their own true self to, wor to work. And what I mean by that is you should be able to come and feel safe and feel like I'm who I am. I'm not two different people. Like you see people walking into work and they could be wearing a suit, whatever. Like they have to, might have to wear a suit for the culture, but they're able to talk openly and they're able to bring their, their true beliefs to work and feel like that she matters, right? Um, a supportive space that allows for the embraces of design thinking. And like what I'm talking about there, oh, I'm standing in the way, sorry, uh, for diverse thinking, okay? So if you've got a thought process that, um, you know, you, you think, you assume that other people just know, 
it's important to be able to raise your voice up and say, well, actually, I disagree with that and not feel like you're going to get in trouble. So encouraging that diversity in thinking. Diversity means lots of things, but for me, it's really about having an inclusive and a diverse people in, in your team to be able to bring different perspectives to the problem. A space to play and experiment. This is huge, okay? So it's not just about um, getting a ping pong table in the corner of the room and kind of going, hey, lads, you want to play ping pong? It's about a place to experiment and uh, encourage that kind of safe room to be able to, to test and try new things. And it's, it's really proven. It's, there's, there's reports and white papers out there to say that, you know, if you're, if you're in a playful place, uh, you're going to be a lot more creative. And I've got some data to back this up, okay? And you're going to be a lot more uh, productive as well in the workplace. And a place to feel safe. So, um, obviously, I'm not talking about that there's a, there's a distance between me and the road here. <laughs> I'm talking about feeling safe as regards you're not going to lose your job for speaking up. And you're not going to lose your job for, um, you know, whatever, for saying something that someone might disagree with. It's about being able to challenge authority and uh, challenge the structure of an organization and challenge power, where power sits in an organization. So uh, that's what I mean by a place to, to feel safe. Space to feel welcome. So going back to the first piece there about being able to bring your true self to, uh, to work. Um, you know, if you're from uh, other origins or other ethnicis ethnicities, um, be able to feel that you're part of that group and you're not like an outsider, you're, you're part of the family. It's, it's really important to, to make people who, who from the outside, when they come in, they feel at home. A space to grow, so you're not sitting and you're not, not developing as a person or a professional, you're actually growing as a human and you're, you're being like, embraced and encouraged to develop in all, all aspects of your life, not just your work life. A space of respect, it's really, really important um, you know, to be able to feel like you know, you're actually contributing to the, the, the solution and, and getting things closer to the way they should be um, and being able to do that. And a space to communicate face to face. Man, I don't know what's going on in the world, but everyone is just like a, you know, going on, online and they're not speaking face to face. I love to walk up to people and kind of go, let's go for a coffee, you know, and let's talk about that problem. Let's talk about that email that you sent yesterday that was going to take me an hour to respond. Let's get back to basics. Let's just start having conversations again. Like, you'll, you'll actually be surprised how quickly you can get through some of those problems. So stopping, turn off your email. Don't let that control you. Go and have a conversation. You'll feel much better for it as well, and you're not sitting at your desk. A space to share your work and communicate. So, um... Yeah, okay, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. Sorry, I'm a little bit out here. So prototyping. Hands up who knows what prototyping is. Hey, I'm going to show hands. All right, prototyping. It's really, really important. And I'm going back to that piece that I said earlier. See, I'm closing the loop. Um, in NCAD, when I was studying industrial design, we prototyped, and I was going mad. We had this blue foam. And we used to have to chip away with it a chisel, and I'm like, what am I doing? I'm trying to build a car out of a big blue piece of foam, but... What I was doing there, I was actually experimenting and I was literally f seeing the form shape in front of my hands. And it's prototyping is developing a potential solution um, so you can test and get feedback from with real, real people. So it could be in this space of, it could be a conversation. I could be saying to you like, hey, um, do you like my glasses? All right? And you'd be like, no. And I'm like, put on another pair. Do you like those ones? That, that in itself, these, this could be a prototype, okay? So a prototype is about experimentation, which goes back to one of the other environmental concerns. So um, prototyping, uh, again, it's, it's a mindset for the organization. Being able to take them on that journey and saying, listen, look, we're going to test a few things. We're going to experiment as we go along. We're gonna, um, you're going to feed into that potential problem, and um, you're a part on that journey. So getting your hands dirty, closing your hands, sketching to, to solve a problem, really embracing the power of, of that whole kind of hand-to-mind connection. Um, in any, any industry you're in, I encourage you to return to basics and start to explore the, the sketching form. So you don't have to be in um, design. You can actually be in other forms, like visually take notes at a meeting is a really powerful way to get people around the problem. Take them on that journey and get them back to basics. All right, so... Um, the encourage to build and experiments and encourage to try new things. Um, encourage to remain curious. It's one of the big things for me whenever I'm meeting designers. Who, I want to see if they've got that design craft. It's not just about 
you know, you've got the degree or you've got the diploma, or whatever it is, you've got some experience. Design craft is learned, okay? It's, it's through experience, it's through application of method, and it's, it's an intrinsic thing, I believe. You can educate people to become designers, but it's something that goes beyond that. Design craft sits somewhere in the space between your inner uh, values and your external kind of um, your skill set. It sits in between those, those two. Um, encouraged to grow. I keep on mentioning that one, trying to get that point hit home. Um, uh, encouraged to, to problem solve in 3D. So um, you're, you're developing something and you're getting feedback from it really earlier. And why I'm saying this is because if you're in an organization that's not um, valuing this type of work, you're, you're actually not going to grow and you're not going to be able to get closer to that craft of design. It's really, really important to go and have a conversation with your boss, have a conversation with whoever it is who's got the power in your organization say, listen, look, I think we need to do more prototyping. So you could be designing interfaces, you could be designing physical products, you could be designing a service, you could be working in a restaurant. You say, listen, look, I know you don't want to move the counter over here. I know you want to do that because you think it's the right way to do it, but let's just test it. Let's do a day over here and let's measure it. Let's put some, some things around it. So to me, design sits across all those different types of touch points. Um, you're encouraged to connect thoughts to doing. So what I'm just saying there about the boss, and he's like, no, I think it should be over there. And you're like, well, I think it should be over here. And it's about meeting that middle ground and prototyping it and getting some, some real um, feedback. Collaboration, right? To me, this is everything. What I was saying earlier about email, getting away from email, it's about getting the people in the room that actually contribute to delivering those services or those products. Um, it's, it's really, really important. So having a shared ownership of the problem, it's not just about you being the genius. It's not about celebrating the designer who's like, we can't do innovation, we can't do design because he's ringing sick. It's not about you, it's about like inclusivity and including everyone in those problems. So it's about getting a representative uh, you know, set into the room. Inclusivity by design, so like you're actually, it's an intention. You sit back before you do anything and you say, okay, I need to be inclusive. I need to include these people in this conversation. There's nothing nice about finding out on a Friday night that your friends have gone out for a drink and you've been left behind. That's never happened to me. Maybe it has. <laughs> well, not that I know about. They could be out Friday and Saturday. But um, my point is, it's about an intention. And you know, designing that process is as important as designing the outcome sometimes. Um, intended collaboration, which I've spoken about. Uh, everyone who contributes to the creation of products and services should be involved. Embracing resistance and change. Look. If you're going through this process and you want to get your organization to be more design craft, I'm going to tell you, it's hard work. It's not easy. You're pushing people out of their boundaries. They're in their safe zone. They're sitting at their desk nine to five. And they're like, have me lunch in 20 minutes, winning. But it's about pushing them out of that process, out of that world, and getting them into like a new world. You're, you're breaking through the boundaries. You might be the most popular person in your office for a couple of years, but so what? You know, you're actually driving change. So... Appreciating and trusting in the craft of design, and that's a big thing for me. When I, when I speak to people and I'm trying to un understand their level of craft of design, it's like really trusting. Like, I believe everything that I'm saying here. This is like not waffle. This is actually something that I really believe that we can actually change the world here. And you know what? We all deserve the best. You know, like if you go out there into, into the world and you, you see uh, services from the Irish government that are being released, and you're like, you know what? This is kind of crap. This is kind of crap. Stand up, get on Twitter, get on Facebook, pick up the phone and say, why can't I do this? Because it's those kind of actions that are going to drive Ireland to become where it should be, okay? Sorry, a little bit of a rant there. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> Go! Anyway, less genius and more senior. Hands up who knows who, knows who Brian Eno is. All right, I encourage everyone, if you don't, go and listen to some of his stuff. The guy's a bit nuts, but I love him. And he has a phrase, less genius and more senior. And what that means is, the designer can't be seen as being the guy who, who does it. It's seniors is like the group of people, like getting the right people in the room. It's, it's a community-based effort. And I really believe organizations are mini communities. So you, you'll see these patterns emerge as you start working in this field. And empowering teams to make decisions. It's not about waiting for the boss to come into the room and kind of go, all right, so we've gone through this workshop and we've done all these problem solvings. Now what do you think? It's not about that. It's about having the conversation with your boss and saying, listen, look, let's move closer to giving us some sort of autonomy and being able to make those decisions ourselves. We're adults, okay? We're not in school anymore. So let's have those conversations about placing power in a different position. And trusting the team. It's like, 
how, how nice is it when you feel like you're being trusted and are empowered to make a decision? It goes so far, right? And this all is stems from the craft of design, being able to have that power to make the decision and having that respect from your employers. So the future, I know I did a bit of a rant here in middle, middle ago, I'm gonna go again. Someone hold me back. So why this matters, right? People with design craft are 47% more productive than those without. So lads, the guys who put their hands up here, you can finish at two o'clock today because you're 40% more productive. Don't, just as a disclaimer, don't say that I said that. Um, people with design craft deliver almost 11 euros 40 extra per hour, right? In value to the organization. This is not something to, to be littled. You go back to your boss with these metrics in your hand and kind of go, look, I know you like money because you're the owner of the business, but I can save you 11.40 an hour. And over, that's nearly 100 euro a day. That's like 500 euro a week. It's two grand a month. Let's start talking. Businesses with design craft and better are able to maximize opportunities for technological advancement. This is a huge thing. I don't know any businesses out there who are hiring designers that kind of go, I don't think innovation or design is going to work. I think we need to go back to basics and put all our stuff on the website back into a booklet and put it in the library for you to go to get like you had to do in the 80s and then fax it, right? If you are working in those places, I encourage you to GTFO, right? Um, okay, so the next one is, you're all like, GTFO. Businesses of the craft are seven times likely to generate new products or services. There seems like most people here are young, like they're like 30s, 40s, um, 50s, closer. Anyway, um, it's, it's, it's about being able to d design those new services and those new products. Nobody wants to work in a place that is doing what I said before, okay? Well, maybe you do, but you'll have to have a conversation with me at the end and I'll try and change your mind. So this is, to qualify this, this all above relates to designers with craft and experience. So what I mean is people that, you know, you go back to your boss and he goes, yeah, listen, look, we spoke to a couple of people and we're going to bring in some designers. It's about designers with skills and designers with experience and designers with that whole 10,000 hours and application. It's not just about designing and saying, okay, we, we hired a team of 20 designers. It's going to happen. It's not, okay? You need to bring people who've got fire in their bellies, who've got passion, and that own that craft. Okay, like I spend most of my day in meetings going... Listen, come on, let's do this. We can do it. We can change the world. They all think I'm batshit crazy, but I believe it, okay? And that's what I'm talking about. The design craft is something that's inside your belly, <coughs> not physically, <laughs> all right? So, um, and it's a, really, it's a really important thing is the mindset, okay? And that's different. So, like, your boss mightn't be from a mindset of design. He might be from a business background or usually from a financial background. So, it's taking them on the journey to appreciate looking at the world differently, it actually, as you can see the slide before, it really makes a difference to the bottom line. So let's make Ireland, or everyone in the world, look to Ireland for inspiration about design. Like, I did not come home, this is, sounds like a rallying cry, I did not come home to hope that Ireland gets back to the way it was in the 80s, okay? I really believe that Ireland is in a really strong place, economically, to drive forward. I can tell you from an Australia, when the same-sex marriage thing came around, it created lots of negative conversations in Australia as regards, why aren't we doing this, right? And I was so proud to be in, in Sydney to say, listen, look, look at this. If we can do it, you guys can do it. It took them four years, but they got there in the end. So I really believe, like, we are the champions. In this room, we are the champions of design. I want you to go back to your organizations. Start speaking about design to the people in power and actually start bringing design into the conversation. So talk about where it sits in the organization. You might have a, a couple of designers wearing Converse and T-shirts in the corner. Uh, go and speak to them. Talk to them. <laughs> They're not that bad, right? <laughs> um, go and bring them into conversations and say, listen, look, what kind of designer are you? Like, what kind of skills do you have? Because what I'm seeing is there's a lot of designers in Ireland who've got some incredible experience, but the organizations are so behind. They're not allowing them to grow. And that's really, really important. It's about al allowing design to come into the conversation. And it's not about design owning the conversation. It's really about them bringing a different perspective to it. Okay? So um, have those difficult conversations with the person who can evoke a change. So go into the boss and kind of go and talk to me about design. Where are you at? 
most of the thought leaders in your business, they'll read Inc.com, they'll read the Harvard Business Review. I'm not speaking about stuff, I'm not like bleeding edge, I'm not coming up with this. This stuff has been spoken about in the Harvard Business Review. This is important stuff. If you really care about driving the organization forward and driving your career forward, have those conversations. You might think you're nuts, or she might think you're nuts, but have that conversation and let them know, put that seed into their mind that there's people in the team that are starting to care about this and you want to change, okay? It's really about trying to get that conversation happening at a very early stage. Start having a conversation. I'll put these slides up on my Twitter later on. Twitter's down here, Jerry Circus. Follow me. No, I will. I'll put it up later on if you want to, and you can forward on, because there's a couple of slides in there that you might find are, are helpful to drive the conversation on, okay? Um, I meant to take that last bit out, but anyway, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> I, should, I should, that comes with a caveat. I'm working for EY CERN, and, um, which is a fantastic organization in Dublin, and um, if, I, if I can come, I will, you know, absolutely. Like, I really believe in that. Um, I'm joking, I intended to leave it in there, but I'm glad I got a laugh. Um, so understand what it takes to grow and evoke change. So like if you go to your boss and say, let's talk about design, and he goes, well, what does that look like? And if you go, I don't know, you're gonna look a little bit kind of like, so do a little bit of you know intention and in designing that conversation and how it might look. Have something in your back pocket, could be my slides, could be some stuff online. Whatever it is, just, just think about that conversation and present it to them in a way that you can actually start the conversation from growing. And finally, this is where I start being like Obama, we can. Um, I really believe it, I, I totally believe this. We all deserve the best, you know, and don't settle for mediocrity in, in design and anything that you do. Like the only way we're gonna get to where we need to get to and push Ireland forward is through putting us being the society and humans in the middle of the problem. So don't s sacrifice or sit back and kind of go, just, that's just the way it is. It's not, okay? We need to speak up, we need to challenge things, we need to like challenge our organizations, challenge people to work together, challenge people to be friends, challenge people to have conversations. It's the most important thing, all right? Thank you very much. If you want to get in contact, there's my email. Um, thank you.